Start again. Okay. Hemopoiesis is the overall production of the formed elements of your blood. We all agreed the formed elements of your blood are like the cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Okay? So when we talk about the formation of the red blood cells, that's going to be erythropoiesis. We'll talk about that. Okay? So understand our final product of the red blood cell. I'll jump back one slide. The final product of the red blood cells, okay, all right, when you have an erythrocyte, you have no nucleus inside and you have no organelles. They're gone, okay? So if that red blood cell gets damaged, and we'll talk about what happens to that, all right, when that red blood cell gets damaged, it doesn't have ribosomes to help fix the damaged proteins. So that red blood cell is going to get tossed out, okay? So keep that in mind. At one point, all right, when we lose the, the nucleus here, that's going to happen here at the normal blast stage, okay? We lose the nucleus at the normal blast stage, right? We still have, all right, organelles. Now we get to the reticulocyte. Think of the reticulocyte as a baby red blood cell, all right? So if you are looking at a CBC with diff, which is, you know, uh, your blood panel with differential, and they actually look at a microscopic slide of your blood, okay? and they, they differentiate all the different parts, okay? So when you're looking at that, and it'll say on the report, increased number of reticulocyte count, then you know those are baby red blood cells, all right? And there could be a reason for that. They're not uh, differentiating or maturing, all right? Or you could be having low blood oxygen, so your body's trying to make more red blood cells, so you have an increase. There could be several causes, okay? But in our baby red blood cell, we do not have organelles except for ribosomes. And as long as we have our ribosomes, we can make proteins. That's good. And we do. We need to make some. But finally, when we get to the mature or the erythrocyte level, all right, now our ribosomes go bye-bye. We can't make any more proteins. Okay? So we can't have anything happen to that cell. Otherwise, the body's going to discard it, discard it, and we'll talk about that. All right. The next one here is leukopoiesis, right? So how do we make our leukocytes? So we need to know what the leukocytes all right, are. So we have our granulocytes, our monocytes, and our lymphocytes. Those are all going to be our white blood cells. We're going to, <clears throat> excuse me, we are going to then right, differentiate our granulocytes into neutrophils, and I'm going to go through each one of these individually, so don't worry. All right, the basophils and the eosinophils. But what we saw before when we were doing erythropoiesis, okay, the red blood cell production, all right, we had multi-colony, eh, colony stimulating factor, okay. Now we have that in addition, all right, to another colony stimulating factor which is going to help to propagate, all right, the myeloid stem cell, all right, to then differentiate into, all right, one of our myeloblasts and then into a granulocyte. So what the heck is he talking about? Let me show you on our picture here. Okay, so you remember when we talked about this last, what's today? Wednesday? So Monday, okay? We have our pluripotent stem cell, okay? This is the starting guy. And they can differentiate either into the myeloid line or the lymphoid line. Don't worry about the lymphoid line right now. We're not talking about that. Okay? So we differentiate into the myeloid line. Okay? Then we have our multi-colony multi -colony stimulating factor that acts on it. And it promotes it into, uh, into erythropoiesis. It's going to become a red blood cell. Okay? So if that occurs now, all right, we can go down this line here, all right, with our multi-CSF. Now, if we have our multi-CSF and then in addition, we've got our GM-CSF, okay, that's our granulocyte colony stimulating factor. Now, all right, we will either differentiate, in, we'll get our, our, our progenerator cell right here, all right? But then we'll either differentiate into a granulocyte line or the monocyte line depending on 
which of the colony stimulating factors we produce, either the G or the M colony stimulating factor. I'm not really too worried about that, but what I want you to draw out of this is certain, all right, hor not hormones, excuse me, chemicals right, are going to influence the direction or what those cells are going to differentiate into, okay? They will be, all right, it's not just some random thing, it's just whatever, what chemicals are present are going to cause the cell to differentiate into that specific cell line. Okay, so we're going to break that down here. That was a long, drawn-out way to explain that, but it's worth it. Okay, so we start off, all right, when we're talking about our granulocytes, all right, our progenerator cell must first then differentiate into a myeloblast, okay? And then that's going to be a granulocyte, which can be um, any of these cells here, the neutrophils, the basophils, and the acinophils, okay? Now, if we produce the M colonating, excuse me, I can't talk today, colony stimulating factor, right, then our progenitor cell is going to differentiate into the monocyte line here, okay, and it'll become a monoblast, all right, and then it goes through a, a series of steps and eventually into a monocyte. A monocyte is the blood's version or a circulating version of a macrophage, okay? Macrophages only live in tissue, all right? When they're floating through the blood, they're a monocyte. And then say you damage tissue, all right, or there's an infection in some tissue, all right? The, the monocyte will then migrate to that area. When it gets into the tissue, it transforms into a macrophage, the Pac-Man cell. That eats up pathogens, helps to repair, not repair, but it, 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 it eats up the damaged tissue. If, if you cut yourself or whatever, it eats up the, the damaged tissue so you can fix that, okay? All right, so that's leukopoiesis. All right, then, all right, we have these guys right here for leukopoiesis. Remember, leuco is our white blood cells, all right? So going back to this chart here, All right, remember, when we have our pluripotent stem cell, all right, instead of going towards the myeloid line, now we have the lymphoid line, and that's going to be our lymphocytes. So they have their own special type of stem cell, all right, their own special type. Up to this point, all right, all the other cells that we were talking about come from the myeloid stem cell line. So easy to remember, okay, you have two types of stem cells that come off of our pluripotent uh, stem cell. You have the myeloid line and the lymphoid line. So how do I remember that? All the lymphocytes come from the lymphoid line. All the other cells go to the myeloid line, okay? So that would be your um, platelets, that would be your red blood cells, the granulocytes, okay? And then the monocytes. Those are all from the myeloid stem line, okay? It gets a little confusing because when we talk about leukopoiesis, we're talking about two different stem cell lines, but they have to do with how we get our white blood cells. And that's, that's the thing. A lot of this is just terminology. You just have to memorize it. All right. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Here we go. Okay. So the other part of leukopoiesis comes from the myel, or excuse me, the, the lymphoid stem cell line. And this is where we're going to get are B cells and T cells, okay? Or the stem cell is gonna differentiate into a B lymphoblast and or uh, a T lymphoblast. And then they'll mature and grow up into, into B and T uh, lymphocytes, okay? And then, to make things more complicated, all right, some of these lymphoid stem cells will directly turn into our NK or natural killer cells. So a lot of you don't have a single clue as to what I'm talking about. I promise you, when we get into the immune system, we will talk about these cells much more in depth, okay? So I don't want you to feel like you have to memorize each of these different stages, okay? What I would do is I would know this cell here and the two lines, all right? And then I'd go all the way to the bottom, and see the final stages for all these cells, okay? And know which line they come from, okay?
Okay, so like I said before, the easiest way to do it is to learn what comes from the lymphoid stem cell line. That's all the lymphocytes. The B lymphocytes, the T lymphocytes, and natural killer cells. That's it. You can write that down. You should be able to walk out of this room tonight and know that. And then you can say all other cells. If you don't hear lymphocyte after it or killer cell after it, then you know platelet, bam, that's from the myeloid line. Okay, erythrocyte, bam, that's from the myeloid line. Okay, that's going to be this side over here. Okay. So, oh, the reason why I wanted to show you this is because you can see, okay, when we're talking about the lymphoid line, all right, the lymphoid stem cell, all right, it can do one of two things. It can differentiate into a B lymphoblast or a T lymphoblast, or it can go directly down here to a natural killer cell, okay? If it differentiates into a B lymphoblast or a T lymphoblast, it then has to differentiate one more time before it's a B lymphocyte or a T lymphocyte. All right. And then finally, we jump into all right, thrombopoiesis. A thrombocyte is another name for our platelets. Okay. So for thrombopoiesis, Okay, we are going to, again, start off with the myeloid stem cell. That's going to be on the left side of that picture that I was showing. And so what we have is this huge, huge cell. We call it a megakaryocyte. All right. And we have some, some uh, chemical messengers, all right, that work on this megakaryocyte. Okay. And this megakaryocyte will migrate. It's going to find. It's got to find a blood vessel somewhere. So it's going to migrate to a blood vessel, and it grows. All right, these extensions. Okay, these extensions will expand or extend off of the cell body. All right, through uh, uh, the blood uh, the blood vessel. Okay, into the lumen of the blood vessel. And as it does that, parts of it break off. And those pieces that break off are um, platelets. I'll show you a good picture. I'll come right back to the slide. This is what I'm talking about right here. Okay. So here you can see, all right, the bone marrow all right, has made these megakaryocytes, these big guys right here. And they start to grow these extensions. And these extensions then, all right, squeeze in between the simple squamous epithelium of a capillary or the endothelium. And as they do, all right, the blood flow just kind of pulls off pieces of the cell. And those little tiny pieces that get pulled off are the platelets. And they're, they're responsible for uh, the blood clotting. Okay. Let me go back. Okay. So that's what we're going to see. We're going to create our, our platelets from the overall large cell, which is called the megakaryocyte, all right? And then we're going to have these little extensions that come off that get stuck in the bloodstream there, all right? It's like uh, taking a Coke. You're in a, by a stream, and you take a Coke, and you kind of pour the Coke out into the stream, and the stream washes the bits and pieces of the Coke downstream. That's what happens here. All right, the blood flow kind of will break off pieces of the cell there, all right? And those small fragments are now our platelets, okay? Yes, I'm back, Brittany. Are you back? I know you just said that up there. It's been up there for a while. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the cells in the blood, all right? So let me ask you this. Can anyone, if you centrifuge out the blood, can anyone name me the three layers to centrifuge blood off the top of your head? The buffy layer. The, everyone always remembers the buffy layer. Yeah, yeah, the buffy layer is that middle layer. That's the smallest layer. And that's where your, your white blood cells will be hanging out. And, all right, does anyone remember the other ones? What's the bottom one? It's the red blood cells. Yep, pretty much. And then what's the top one? Plasma. Yep, that's right. Okay. And remember that uh, the majority of your plasma, 92% of your plasma is going to be water, right? About 70, 70, excuse me, 7% will be the proteins, okay? And then less than 1% will be, um, what did I say? Not the, um, ah, 
the regular, it'll come to me, golly. Yes, yes. It's a good thing you brought that up because we're going to talk about, and I had this conversation with my kids. I tried to. I'm always trying to communicate with my children because I want to teach them about the world. One of the topics that I wanted to talk to them about was why poop is the way it's colored. Why is it that color? And why is your pee that color? And they didn't want to hear about it. But you get to hear about it today. I am going to teach you why the poop and pee that comes out of your body is the way it's colored. And it has to do with red blood cells. So this is a great segue into that. And I know everybody at home is anxiously awaiting why that is. All right? All right. So let's talk about red blood cells. Okay? First of all, this makes up the majority of your formed elements. And it's, it's crucial that you know this. They are flexible. They need to be flexible because they have to squeeze through small areas. And if they're not, then they'll get damaged. And when they're damaged, they get discarded. Okay? Obviously, they're going to be small. So we talked about this. They have no nucleus. A mature red blood cell has no nucleus. So it only is going to live for 120 days on average, okay, on average, okay, and it also does not have any cell organelles, okay, so pretty much that whole cell is made up of hemoglobin, I can't remember the top, the number off the top of my head, it's like, I think it's 280 million, mm -hmm. uh, or 289 million mm -hmm. hemoglobin molecules, mm -hmm. is it 280, all right, so the 280 million molecules of hemoglobin in one red blood cell, each molecule can bind four oxygen. So you do the math. That's a lot. If you think about it, molecules, because we need oxygen, okay? All right. What is it? I'm going to show it to you, but I mean, the main thing at the center of it is going to be iron, all right? And I'm going to give you an interesting fact, and I'm going to come back to that, okay? So we describe the, the, um, the cell itself as a biconcave uh, structure. I want to say I've got a picture here. There it is. Okay. All right, so when we're looking at it at the top, all right, it's like a ring, like a donut, okay, with the center being very, very thin, or it should be, uh, they call it, it's supposed to be, the pallor of it should be very light because it's thinner there. So it's like a donut, except there's no hole in the middle. Okay. So it had that appearance there. Right. But there's an important protein on the inside. It's called spectrin, and there are certain disorders that affect the spectrin. And when the spectrum becomes affected, then the red blood cells go to, excuse my language, go to crap. They become easily damaged, and then they're useless, and they get tossed out. Also, if you don't have spectrin in there, instead of it having that biconcave appearance, it'll look like this, circular, spiritosis. I think that's the term. Um, and it's because, again, and when it's like that, it's a problem because it can't fit into those small nooks and crannies, and these shaped red blood cells don't last long. So when they line up in your blood, okay, like a stack of quarters or pennies, they call that a rouleau. It's French for stack, I think. I don't know. But, I, I always, but it does mean stack. I don't know if it's French. Okay? But it has this rouleau configuration. I'll show you real quick here. You can see the rouleau configuration right here. All these red blood cells are stacked on top of one another. Okay, so they can line up as they're flowing all right, through your blood stream, mainly the capillaries, because the capillaries are, are pretty much can only accommodate one red blood cell at a time. Okay, one at a time. All right, so this fact is uh, increasingly important, so you definitely need to know the purpose of the red blood cell. Simple job, okay? to carry carbon dioxide away from tissues to the lungs and oxygen from the lungs to the tissues. That's it. That's it. Okay? Very important that you know that. If anything, you walk out of here today, you should know that. And that there's 280 million. I've seen an old test question. I didn't make the test question, but one of my colleagues did, in which um, it says that you it asked you as the student to figure out how many – uh, oxygen molecules can uh, uh, one single red blood cell carry. They required you to know that the red blood cell could carry uh, 280 million heme, heme molecules and that each heme molecule can bind four oxygen. Just, just to keep that in mind. No, probably not. 
You could learn that in the magic school bus. All right, so we cannot not talk about hemoglobin if we're talking about red blood cells, okay? So hemoglobin is what we were just talking about here uh, just a moment ago, all right, is that molecule that transports the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, okay? So it's important that you know the terms there when we're talking about oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood, all right? So even though you have deoxygenated blood, and veins carry deoxygenated blood, all right? It doesn't mean that, you know, I used to think, oh, arteries carry blood that's oxygenated and veins carry blood with no oxygen. No, that's not the case. They, they'll carry all right, just a very low percentage of oxygen compared to arteries, okay? So when we're talking about the configuration of a hemoglobin molecule, all right, it's made up of four globule, globins, excuse me, the globins are just proteins. So there's different ways when proteins are made, okay? Just like if you take a piece of paper, all right? You take a piece of paper, there's lots that you can do with a piece of paper. You can ball it up into a circular configuration. You can fold it up, all right? That's what your cells and your body does to proteins, okay? So in this situation, okay, your hemoglobin molecule is made up of two different structured proteins, all right? We have what's called alpha chains and beta chains. The beta chains look more like a sheet, like a flat piece of paper, and then the alpha chains are just kind of like these squiggly folded lines, okay? And what we do is we, we have a combination of all that when we have a hemoglobin molecule here. But the important thing is, is, all right, in each chain we have this heme group present. All right, and in that heme group, we have it's a ring-like structure. And at the center of the ring is this guy, iron. Apparently I say it weird because my family makes fun of me. Iron. All right. Iron is the center of this molecule. Wait a minute, come back. There it is. Okay. So if you look at this, there's iron at the center of it. All right, this is our heme group here, and this is the hemoglobin molecule. See how it's all twisted up in, in, in shape? So when proteins, and your body is always checking this configuration when it's making these proteins. And if it's folded wrong, it kills the protein. Okay, remember the proteosomes? Probably not. The proteosomes are the cell thing. <laughs> proteosomes are the cell organelles version of, of uh, quality control. They sit inside the cell, okay? And you'll have proteins that are floating around, and this, this structure will go around and it kind of checks certain proteins. If they're folded wrong, if they have the wrong ingredients, the proteosome digests the proteins and breaks it down into individual amino acids so we can recycle, okay? So they're always chewing up on these guys here, okay? So here you can see our two different chains here, all right? But at the center of each of these, sessions at the center, but attached onto these chains, we have a heme group, and that's what we're seeing here. And at the center of the heme group is iron. So we need to have iron to have properly functioning hemoglobin. Okay? And why? Because that's where oxygen binds to. Bless you. Okay? That's what oxygen binds to. So if you don't have iron, you're not going to be able to bind the oxygen to the heme group. Questions so far? Am I going too fast? I'll slow it down. I'll slow it down. Check this out. See this picture right here? I think I already, did I tell you? All right, if we replace this molecule, or that element, that atom, I should say, if we replace that atom, the iron, with magnesium, we just made chlorophyll. Isn't that crazy? Chlorophyll and hemoglobin, this is just an FYI, you won't be testing on it. But chlorophyll and hemoglobin are almost identical, except for we as humans have iron and plants have magnesium. It's crazy to me. Anyways, I learned that, I don't know, not too long ago. Okay. We need magnesium, and this is the thing. Yeah, magnesium, and unfortunately, I haven't taught you guys, well, unless you had me for 210. 
um, and I didn't even know this at the time, but the ATP molecule, the last two phosphates on the ATP molecule have a magnesium bound onto that. And so you need magnesium to both synthesize and to help break down ATP molecules. So there's magnesium is involved in over 600 enzymatic reactions in your body. Shoot, I thought it was important that it was important that it was used in over 100, but 600 enzymatic reactions in your body you need magnesium. So if you're not taking magnesium, take it. It's very important. All right. So let's talk about hemoglobin and its relationship with oxygen. Okay? So as we know, hemoglobin is the is the is the molecule that that holds on to the oxygen when it's traveling through the blood. Okay? So it's important to understand that when oxygen binds onto hemoglobin, it has a weak binding with it. Okay? And that's good. Because it's like giving that kid, all right, hey, you give the kid, hey, can you hold my ice cream for me for a second, kid? All right, I need it right back. Just hold it. And then you go try to get it back and it won't get it, and the kid won't give the ice cream back to you. We want, all right, we definitely want oxygen to bind onto all right, the, the iron and hemoglobin. But we want it to be weak so it can jump onto the iron molecule relatively fast, okay, in the lungs. Because as you're taking a breath in and you're flooding your lungs with oxygenated air, all right, it's like trying to, we got to get that oxygen onto the blood as it's moving. And guess what? The blood doesn't stop flowing when it's in the capillary. It doesn't stop and the oxygen just crosses over like at a train at a train station. No, it's more like, have you ever tried to jump onto a moving train? That's what it's like. You know, back in the, I think the 1920s during the Great Depression, a lot of people took trains around the country, hobos they were called. They would jump on the train and jump off the train. That's oxygen and carbon dioxide, all right? It's trying to like jump onto a moving train. So we want it to have a weak binding because it makes it easier for the oxygen to jump on. And then when it gets to the tissue, okay, it's not going to do any good if the body has to exert a lot of energy to try to pull that oxygen off, especially if those tissues are metabolizing things, all right? So it has that rapid um, process of attaching and detaching in the lungs and the tissues there because of that weak binding ability there, okay? Same thing with carbon dioxide, all right? But here's the important thing. Carbon dioxide does not bind onto iron. Oxygen does. Carbon dioxide does not. And we'll talk more about this when we're learning about the uh, saturation of oxygen uh, for and, and carbon dioxide for blood. All right, we're not going to talk about that, about that right now. All right, so that's a relatively weak, all right, relationship too. Okay, so just keep in mind right now, our respiratory gases have a weak binding affinity, all right, for the hemoglobin molecule, whereas oxygen binds to iron, all right. But carbon dioxide does not. Okay, it does not. All right. You saw that? All right. So we talked briefly about erythropoietin or EPO in chapter 17. All right. And erythropoietin is a hormone that is generated primarily by the kidneys. Okay, the liver offers some, but it's primarily by the kidneys. And it gets produced when you have low blood oxygen levels. Okay, so that's the stimulus. So going back to that, that process there right, that we talked about in the endocrine system, we have to have a stimulus. So our stimulus is going to be low blood oxygen levels, okay? And you have the, the, the receptors in the kidney will monitor that. And they say, all right, low blood level, low oxygen blood levels are present. Let's start producing erythropoietin. Starts to produce the erythropoietin, which will then stimulate the red bone marrow, in your bones to start to increase the process of erythropoiesis, all right? And then we will start to uh, produce more red blood cells. Eventually that will increase, all right, our blood oxygen levels, all right? And then once the levels raise up, then the kidneys, the receptors in the kidneys will monitor that and see that, and then they'll stop production of the erythropoietin. So that's based on a negative feedback system there, okay? All right, questions on that? All right, so keep in mind, decreased blood oxygen is going to stimulate the production of our erythropoietin, okay? 
And then obviously we've increased the, the amount of uh, red blood cells in circulation that will then increase the blood oxygen level in our blood there. Okay, and then the kidneys will shut it down with the negative feedback once levels are high enough. All right, testosterone is going to be all right, a contributor for erythropoietin production. So that is why males have a higher uh, amount of our hematocrit levels. What's hematocrit? You guys remember? Uh, it's blood volume. Yeah. All right, essentially it is, it's the actual formed elements in the blood, but the red blood cells make up such a vast majority. We just consider clinically, we just look at that as, all right, that's the amount of red blood cells that you have, all right, in your blood, all right, and so um, men will have a higher hematocrit value than women do, okay, because of our testosterone, okay? So I think when we were talking about it in Chapter 17, I was saying how when you go to a higher elevation, folks that have to climb mountains, you know, especially like Mount Everest, it's not like you're there for the weekend climbing Mount Everest or for a week. You're there for a couple of months. You have to go, especially... I don't know too many people that live at sea level and climb Mount Everest, but you have to start to live at higher elevations incrementally. And then you spend like a week to two weeks, they call it base camp. You got base camp one, base camp two. In other words, you spend time at a certain base camp at a certain altitude, you give your body time to create more red blood cells, then you go to the next level. And you stay there for a little bit of time to increase that to produce the erythropoietin, but also they call it acclimatization, excuse me. You're acclimating to the altitude. So this acclimatization, you're seeing if your body can handle it. Because if not, you can go into respiratory arrest and literally die on the mountain, which is not good. They just found a body up there not too long ago that is the longest, they can, the, the, it's not a joke because it's a dead body, but they said it's the longest resident of the mountain. And there's a name for it, and I guess it disappeared for a while. And so the, the thought was that somebody carried the body off. That's not true. They found it again. What? You live there? No, it's just probably something. That, people die up there all the time. I hate, and I'm not trying to make light of it. Uh, but, you know, uh, in 1996, there was two expeditions that went up there, and I think 10 or 12 people died in a big snowstorm. And uh, one guy lost, he spent a night outside in the weather out there. He lost his nose and his ear. And did you ever see the a picture or hear about them growing an ear on the back of a rat this is way back when he was one of the first recipients of that procedure where they were cloning cells and whatnot and so he was a postmaster postman buck somebody merriweather anyways and uh they grew literally they grew his ear on the back of a rat and they were able to reattach it through that process and he was one of the first recipients i remember weird things I guess. It's not worth dying, though. Um, so this is just kind of showing us all right, that whole process with er er erythropoietin. Okay? So your blood oxygen levels go down, the kidney senses that, starts to produce erythropoietin, pumps it into the blood vessel, which goes then to the, the bone. The red bone marrow will start to produce red blood cells. It takes a little bit of time for them to mature, and then it dumps the red blood cells back into the blood then to increase the oxygen carrying capacity, which will then, all right, uh, negatively or, or negative feedback wise, it'll inhibit the production of EPO. Okay. Oh, did I, I did talk to you about blood doping though, right? Okay. So basically, all right, just a quick review here. When we blood dope, it's to enhance the athletic performance, okay, of the said athlete. So what you do is, you um, remove the blood prior to competition, weeks before, all right? And so during that time that you remove the blood and the time that you're going to compete, give it a couple of weeks because, you again, it takes some time for those red blood cells to mature that you're going to make. So your body will naturally start to produce erythropoietin, and then it will replace all those red blood cells that you had taken out of your body. And then right before competition, all right, you transfuse your own blood back into your body, okay, thus increasing your body's oxygen carrying capacity, its potential to, and so you'll, it literally will help you with your uh, athletic performance, especially like in uh, aerobic activities like cycling. That's why Lance Armstrong and a bunch of guys got busted for that, all right? 
leave it right in your refrigerator. Yeah, and you just put it back into your cell. All right. Another way to do it is you can do the uh, the pharmaceutical uh, issue. But like I was telling you folks, was it Monday or last week? One, you're increasing your blood's viscosity. So essentially, you're making not your blood that was like motor oil, which is what it's normally like. Now you're making it into what's thicker than motor oil, but not like gelatin, like syrup. There you go. Not as bad as syrup, but you've increased your blood viscosity close to the consistency of syrup. That's bad. You're going to start to cause all sorts of things. You can damage, all right, certain blood vessels. But look at this guy. This poor guy has to work harder. He's got to pump harder. You have a higher blood volume. You went from five liters to potentially six. I don't know if anybody has ever blood yoked up to seven liters. Um, but your heart now has to pump all that blood that's soupy, okay, and viscous like syrup. So it has to work harder. So you, you increase, all right, heart issues, but also the blood vessels have to handle that. Bad, 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 bad. Naughty, naughty, naughty. All right. Yeah, it, it'll yeah. mimic, it'll do the same thing as, uh, as erythropoietin. It's the pharmaceutical version of it. Okay. So, quick review. Red blood cells, all right, they only live for a short period of time, 120 days, okay? And so, during that time, they have to do whatever their, their, um, their duty is to do for as long as they can, all right? If they get damaged, well, then we're going to get rid of them, all right? If they outlive their life, we're going to get rid of them, all right? So, all right, what we're going to deal with then is we're going to take these old red blood cells and we're going to take them to one of these two um, organs there, either the spleen or the liver, mainly the spleen, all right, and we're going to get rid of them. Okay, but remember, I want you to think of your body that it loves to recycle, okay? It's really good at it, believe it or not. It recycles as much as it can, but it's good at recycling things. So this is a perfect example of red blood cell destruction is a perfect example of how your body recycles things. And this is now we're going to move into that topic of, of what gives our poop and its pee its color. Okay, so we're going to learn how, to, how it does that. Okay, so one of the first things that happens is that these uh, um, organs are going to take iron out of the hemoglobin. Okay, so as the cell starts to get broken down, all right, we're going to take the iron out, okay, and we're going to transport it to the liver. But we can't just have it floating in our blood vessels. Okay, so we're going to slap on transferrin, okay, which is a transport protein, and it's going to carry that iron to the liver, okay, because we're going to we're going to save that as an ingredient when we need it to make further red blood cells. Okay, so we do that. Now what's left over? A bunch of proteins. We got remember proteins are the building are, are, are in everything. So remember the globulins; those make up the alpha and the beta chains in our hemoglobin, so those are proteins, so we're going to start to break those down. And then our membrane proteins, again, we break those down into these guys, amino acids, okay? Now we can use amino acids for so much. We can make them to make more proteins. Guess what else we can make them or use them for? Gluconeogenesis, remember that? Gluconeogenesis, that's the creation when we make all right, glucose from a non-carbohydrate source, fatty acids, glycerol, um, lactic acid, and amino acids, okay? So now we can use it for that. We have, we have lots of uses for it, okay? But primarily, we're just going to recycle these amino acids for something else, all right? So mainly protein synthesis, okay? So we've taken our proteins, we've broken them down into amino acids, we'll use those for something else to make more proteins, maybe some more red blood cells, who knows? All right, and then we're going to take our iron and we're going to transport it to the liver and we're going to store it in the liver and, all right, with these two proteins. Ooh, you know I like to ask you stuff from 210. So, quick review. Just jumped into my head. Does anybody know the two storage proteins for calcium? Remember, chapter 10, the muscles, okay? You're going to look it up. You cheater. <laughs> All right. Cal sequestrin is one and cal modulin. Cal modulin is going to be used. Cal modulin. Give me one second. There we go. Okay. Cal modulin is going to be used 
in smooth muscle contraction also. It's important, okay? Just, just throwing stuff out there. I want you to get your money's worth. All right, so these, iron is gonna bind onto these two proteins and get stored in the liver, all right? And then um, we can recycle that for further or, or new red blood cell production, okay? All right, questions about that so far? You could really kind of appreciate the body's ability to recycle things when we talk about um, the destruction of red blood cells. All right, now we're gonna get into my poop is the way it is and you pee, okay? Don't think that I have, I'm not a fecal filiac, all right, none of that. But again, this is kind of explains that. All right, That's so, pardon? That's a word. Fecal filiac, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, if someone is a, is a filiac of anything, they're, they're yeah. infatuated with it. So, fecal, feces. <laughs> you never heard fecal filiac? Has anyone ever heard that term before? Okay, all right, yeah. All right, so now we've gotten rid of our iron because we're gonna use that for something else. So we're left with our heme group, okay? So guess what? We bring in our macrophages because they have several, several functions. One, immune function, but two, they help with certain pro physiological processes, tissue repair, but we're gonna use them here now to break down the heme group and convert it into this component, this Billy Verdon, okay? And it, not important, but it goes through a series of enzymatic reactions and it ends up as bilirubin. Have you folks heard of bilirubin? Well, I think we've all pretty much heard of bilirubin in some way, shape, or form. Babies, example, all right, if they have that yellowish pigmentation to them, that means they have high levels of bilirubin, all right? And there's ways to deal with that, okay? So what we'll do is we're going to transport this bilirubin to the liver by one of our hugely important proteins that travels in our plasma, albumin, okay? It's the predominant protein that is in our um, plasma, okay? And it's gonna go to the liver, all right? The liver is going to use the bilirubin and, as part of what we call bile, which is a digestive concoction that the liver makes and the gallbladder stores, okay? And when it's time to eat something, usually a fatty meal, all right, it'll be secreted into the small intestine and it'll be used to help to break down the food components there, all right? So, but the important thing is that bilirubin ends up in the digestive system, okay? And if it stays in the intestines, it'll get converted through our friendly bacteria, okay? The bacteria that we wanna have in our large intestine, it'll be converted into stericobilin, and that's what gives your poop the brown color, okay? Now, something else can happen. We'll talk about this in, uh, when we do the digestive system. All right, bilirubin can also be converted into urobilogen, all right? Uro, think of, think of urine, all right? This will happen in the small intestine, and you'll excrete it, all right? It gets absorbed back into the blood, and then it goes through one more process, and it gets converted into urobilin, and that's what gives our urine the yellow color, okay? So ultimately, one of the products that the hemoglobin gets broken down into is going to give your feces and your urine its coloration, okay? And that's another way that we can tell, all right, the color of your stool helps for certain uh, 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 conditions that we can tell if something's going on with your liver, all right? There's a lot, not to sound gross, and I don't think I am, but it really is a lot that you can learn from the color of someone's feces. They're really, and the urine, obviously. If your urine's red, what are you thinking? Blood. If there's some red color in your poop, what are you thinking? Blood. See what I'm saying? Okay. If it's black and tarry, if it's light and tan, it tells you a lot. So I'm just saying, this is all stuff to help you. Um, some people may be like, well, I'm going to be a dental hygienist. Why do I have to know this stuff? All right. It's just part of the course. Who knows? People tell their dental hygienists a lot of things, <laughs> you know? Okay, um, let's talk about anemia. When things go bad, all right, with your red blood cells. When your red blood cells cannot carry oxygen like they should. And there's several causes for that. And it's funny, you know, I was uh, looking over these slides and every semester this happens to me. I say, as I'm looking over the slides, the most common 
form of anemia is not in this list. I forgot, but it's good because it makes me have to explain it to you. Okay. So let's just start off with some of the symptoms. Lethargy is tiredness. Okay. Well, you're going to be tired because you can't carry oxygen to help make energy, right? ATP. So that's no problem. Shortness of breath. Okay. Part of the fact that on that, and we'll learn about this in the respiratory system, when your oxygen level, uh, your carrying capacity is lowered, right, you are going to try to oxygenate your blood more so your breathing rates will change and you're going to feel like you can't catch your breath. Pallor? Pale. You look pale, right? If you're fair-skinned, much like myself, all right, when you can tell when I get really hot, I get flushed because – Obviously, we talked about this. Blood will travel to the cutaneous blood vessels in your skin, right? And when that happens, if you're a, a, a person like myself who's really light skin, you can see that, all right? Folks will be more pale because they don't have as much uh, red blood cells to carry that, all right? Palpitations has to do with the heart, the functioning of the heart's rhythm, all right, and whatnot, and how it's beating, okay? Because if you're not getting high enough oxygen to the tissues, your heart's going to pump faster to get whatever it has there more, all right? All right, so here are a couple of different types. I'm going to run through these real fast. Aplastic anemia means that the, the, the tissue that makes the red blood cells or the formed elements, all right, there's a problem with it, so it's not making enough, all right? So you're not even going to get enough form blood elements. And you can see poisons, toxins, obviously radiation. That's a problem if you know anybody that's ever had to go undergo, I have an iron, yes, uh, yeah, that, an iron deficiency is not listed up there, and I'm going to get into that one. That's the one I was going to lead into, Brittany. That's the most common type of, of anemia is, they call it IDA, iron deficiency anemia. And most likely, did they ask you to take uh, iron supplements to help treat that? Most likely, that's what they usually do. Depends on how bad. Yep, yep, okay, yeah. Usually it's because you're not getting enough iron, all right, and so we're just going to give you the ingredient, okay? Congenital hemolytic anemia, we'll talk about that in, in a moment, but basically the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, uh, get destroyed. You can't give blood, that's a bummer. Even if you take your pills, yeah, usually if you have anemia, yeah, no. Well, it could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. All right, erythroblastic anemia. This is the one I was telling you about. We'll see a lot of the immature cells, okay? So you'll see a lot of reticulocytes floating around, okay? Hemorrhagic, think about it. When you're hemorrhaging, what are you doing? You're bleeding, okay? So that's from blood loss. All right, pernicious one. This is, I do believe I mentioned this to you before, vitamin B12. This is the, the uh, vitamin B12. Uh, uh, that is deficient in vegetarians, especially vegans. They eat no meat products, and you have a high amount of vitamin B12, all right, that's present. And the problem is, all right, you can't absorb the B12 because in the, the ileum, the last portion of your small intestine, you are not producing intrinsic factor. And that intrinsic factor helps with all right, B12 absorption. If you don't have B12, you cannot form, all right, your red blood cells appropriately. Sickle cell. This is highly prevalent in the African-American community, all right? Um, and again, it's another genetic defect, but our hemoglobin is going to be abnormal, but the cell literally looks like a sickle, like that, okay? And, and so when it travels around, it can't squeeze through small spaces, so it gets, these cells get damaged quickly, and, and, the, and these folks that have sickle cell anemia, um, depending on how bad it is, um, it used to be that you couldn't participate in certain school events. I don't know if it's that bad anymore, uh, if they're as strict. Okay. All right. Blood typing. Yes. Getting the blood typing here. Now you can know... Um, a little bit more about uh, what blood typing is, okay, and why it's very important to give the correct blood, all right, to people that are in need, okay? So I'm going to point out a couple of things, and it might seem, uh, hopefully it won't seem redundant, all right, but I want you to understand, when we're talking about blood typing, 
All right, I'm A positive. That means that the surface antigens on the membrane surfaces of my erythrocytes have, all right, this A, this specific type of protein, okay, this A antigen, all right, protein. And that specifically marks my red blood cells, all right, as type A, okay? So we can either have, all right, the presence of an A antigen or, all right, the presence of a B antigen, or we could have both uh, A and B antigens, or we can have none at all. Okay, so there's four different ways or possibilities. So it makes sense, all right? You're either type A, type B, type AB, or type O. Okay, so when you say I'm type AB, then I know right away that okay, you got both A and B surface antigens. I know that. If you say I'm type O, I think of zero. That means you don't have any surface antigens. All right. So keep that in mind. What are these surface antigens? Proteins, of course, attached with a carbohydrate group attached. Okay. When we went back to chapter four, all right, you learned about surface markers and identity markers for cells. Those are glycoproteins that fulfill that role. Okay. So type A has the surface antigen for A only. Are we all good about that? I can run through this. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure because it's really important that you understand this stuff before we go to the next stuff. Okay. So then type B, surface antigen, surface antigen B. Type AB, you have both, and type O, you have neither. Good, good, good. Are you guys good at home? If you're still paying attention to me, which I know you are. All right, I just remember O as in cool, 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 cool. All right, this is zero. So no surface energy. Okay, good. Then, when we talk about the ABO group, all right, this is really important. A person that has a surface antigen of A, all right, if you have a surface antigen of A, that means, all right, if you have anti means antibody or anti A, all right, anti A antibodies, all right, will react with surface antigen A. So let's make it real easy to conceptualize. I am type A, all right. Would it not be bad that my own blood had antibodies for my own antigen? Right? Because antibodies are an immune uh, response, and that my, my cells would then be attacked by my own antibodies. So therefore, okay, I have what's known as anti-B antibodies. Okay? Since I am blood type A, all right, all right, that means I have a surface antigen of A, okay, but that means I also have anti-B antibodies. All right, so what... Let's circle this point for you. A person doesn't have antibodies for their own surface proteins. Okay? Let's make sense. If I had antibodies for my own surface protein, my body would be attacking myself and I would be clotting my blood and I, well, I wouldn't be teaching you. I'd be dead. All right? Or having blood transfusions quite often. Okay? So let's keep that idea in mind. So that means, all right? Antigen A, which is me, I will react with anti-A antibodies. Anyone here type B? Some people don't know. Okay, no problem. If you're type B, okay, that means, all right, you will react with antibody B antibodies. If you are AB, that means you have both antigens, and that means you'll react, all right, with both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. If you were type O, you have no surface antigens. Okay? Did I, did I, all right, my bad, my bad. I'm going, which one? Antibody, yeah, AB, okay? AB has um, both the surface antigens. Surface ant let me, you know what? Let me show you. Bam, okay? A, B, you have both surface antigens, okay? That, which means that you'll react with the antibodies, okay? If you have no surface antigens like type O, 
then the antibodies can't attack you. Okay. It's, hold on, I see some, believe it or not, I can still see some confused looks just in the eyes. I don't have the face. I've mastered that ability. Okay. Let me go back. Okay. I'm jumping too far ahead and let me just go over the basic stuff first. All right. So type A blood has anti B antibodies in its plasma. Type B blood has anti A antibodies. Okay. So they should be opposite because you will not have antibodies to your own surface antigen. And we all agree on that part. Okay, cool. So that means type AB blood has both surface antigens, correct? Okay. So that means that that person, all right, if you are AB, you cannot have, all right, anti-A or anti-B antibodies in your own blood, in your own plasma. Okay, good, good, good. All right, type O, you have no surface antigens, okay? So you can have both anti-B and anti-A in your own blood. That's fine. You should know surface antigens. It's not going to connect on to anything, okay? So we go here, all right? You can see on the chart here, type A, this is me. Surface antigen A, in my plasma, I have the anti-B antibodies, okay? And you can see how these antibodies are shaped. See this little Y structure there? And my surface antigen, all right? So what does B have to fight off? Um, yeah, B, and, are you talking about the type B or the antibodies? Oh, AB, all right? If you're talking about AB, okay, they, here's the issue with AB, okay? They are going to be, well, we're going to get into that. Are you talking about, um, Blood transfusions? No. <laughs> all, right, all right. What are you talking about? Okay. Okay. Perfect. That's no problem. Because I'm sure that, that some of you are, are confused also. Is anyone like, here is, confused? I guess, like, what does the answer mean? I think she's asking what antigen it has to fight off, but A doesn't have to fight off. Right. A, B is the universal. Right. Right. We're going to get to that. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. I see what you're saying. Hold that thought. That's I always run into this every semester when I teach this. People start thinking about blood donating and all that. Not yet. We'll get there. We'll get there. I just want to get to the basics first. All right. We're going to get into that. All right. So hold that thought. I promise you. I promise you we'll get there. Okay. Let me just run through this part. Okay, so type A has the surface antigen for A, but it has the anti-B antibodies, okay? Which means if you were to give, well, I'm jumping ahead, sorry, we're gonna get there, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Type B, because I really wanna talk about it. Type B, its surface antigen, which looks like this spike, all right, have anti-A antibodies. So your own, all right, antibodies, all right, if you're type B, cannot attack the surface antigen here, all right, because they're different, okay? So keep in mind, your own antibodies will not attack your own cells. It's when you get a transfusion where we're going to run into the problem, okay? So we just need to memorize this, all right? The surface antigens for type A, B have both A and B, but they don't have anti-A or anti-B antibodies. So the point of the antibodies is just to prevent your own body. Well, no, if you get the wrong type of blood in you, then the, that's, that's what we're going to run into. And we're going to get to that in a second. Yep. And then with type O, you don't have any surface antigens, but you have both types of antibodies. All right. This is just you. Let, now we're going to enter into the realm of some confusion here. But before we do, now I'm going to add some more confusion. We're going to talk about RH. So this is where the positive and the negative comes into play. Okay. The RH factor, which... Um, we don't really call it antigen D, all right, but it is another type of antigen, okay? So, and you may have heard this before. You're all right, all right, RH negative, okay, um, which is good, all right? Now, this is where it gets confusing <laughs> when we talk about RH. So, for right now, all right, we're gonna, let me walk you through this, okay? It's this that when we talk about if someone's RH positive or negative, meaning, all right, that they'll have antibodies or not, okay? 
pretty much, let me walk you through this before I go. Okay. So for the most part, the antibodies or the anti-D antibodies, all right, are not usually there. Okay. They're not usually there until you come in contact with, until. This is why it's seen in pregnancy. That's why, has anyone heard of Rogam? Remember Rogam? All right, that's the drug that they'll give to a mom, usually in the second pregnancy, especially if her blood type is different than the baby's blood type because there could be a potential mixing of blood. All right, you do not have the antibodies until, if you are that RH negative person, like, uh, yeah, like, well, if you don't mind me using you as an example, Brittany, Brittany is RH negative. Okay. Now you said both of your kids are different. That means that one of your kids, all right, was RH positive. Okay. Which means, all right, if it was the first kid, okay, once you're exposed, so right now, all right, we'll assume that none of you, because there's only women in here plus myself, that none of you, and you don't have any kids, even if you do, you don't know, all right, that none of you have ever come in contact with you're all RH negative and you've never come in contact with an RH positive person. So you don't have any antibodies, right? None whatsoever. It's not until you come in contact, usually through pregnancy, or you cut yourself while treating somebody that cut themselves and they had, you know, they're RH positive. You don't have antibodies. So, but once you get exposed, now you have the antibodies, okay? If you come in contact again, all right, with somebody, all right, that has the antigens now, the surface antigens, the RH positive, okay, now you have the antibodies, your antibodies will react with those, okay, so you're good until you come in contact with somebody, somebody, I don't want to say something, all right, somebody, okay, because your body right now won't have antibodies, okay, this is the example I'm giving. Yeah, usually, I mean, pregnancy, you get crossing over the placenta there, so there will be a mixing of blood. And that's why we use pregnancy most of the time as the example, because that's the most common type of mixing of blood. I mean, I guess you could say the same thing if people are sharing needles, you know, drug users and whatnot, um, they can come in contact that way too, all right? So when we combine all of these, the ABO and the RA gene, that's where we get like AB positive or A positive. So I'm A positive, all right? I was the youngest of three, and I know one of my siblings is a negative. So, and I know for a fact that when my mom was pregnant with me, she had Rogan because it, it suppressed the immune response. All right, um, not so much. I'm not worried about the RH factor. Let me jump into this part here. When we start talking about donors, this is where I think you guys are getting interested in, all right, or confused about, all right? So let's talk. Pardon? I think it helps. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it will, it will. Because up, up into this point, I'm just talking about the recipient. Okay? So when we're learning about the blood typing, it's the recipient. We haven't donated blood to anybody. So you just need to know, all right, what antigens you have, what antiantibodies you have. Okay? Now we're going to move into now what happens when you receive blood from somebody. All right? So if you receive the wrong type of blood, this process here goes. It occurs. You clump blood, it's called the glutination, all right, where the blood starts to kind of clump up and clot. And what happens when you get clotted blood clumps in your blood vessels? Well, yeah, but what can happen? You block off blood vessels, right? And so you're, and that's not good, okay? So this is what happens. We're going to talk about now as the recipient, we're all the recipient now, okay? I'm going to use my example since no one else in here knows their blood types, all right, or is unwilling to share it with me. All right, you're a positive, sorry. So we're both a positive, okay? So we have the anti-B antibodies. Okay, Casey's O positive. All right, Lucilla's O positive. All right, all right. <laughs> nice, nice. You're the donor, I want your blood. All right, give me your blood. All right, so here's what's happening, all right? We're gonna talk about the recipient's antibodies now. Okay, so if you know your blood type, all right, you know my blood type, I'm A positive. That means I have the anti, let me just, just reiterate, the anti-B antibodies, okay, anti-B antibodies. 
And if you look, we've got these little purple triangles here, and look what cells have the purple triangles on them. Okay? Does type B have the purple triangles on them? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that means that these antibodies will stick on to this cell. Can we agree on that? Okay. Will these antibodies stick onto this cell? Okay. 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 So they'll stick onto this cell. So I can't get, all right, all right. <clears throat> um, I, can, I can't get blood from somebody that's type B, right? Because my antibodies, all right, will react with this blood. And I can't get blood from AB. You guys see that? Because my antibody, look at the shape. Look at, follow the purple, follow the purple. The purple will glom onto the surface here, and the purple will glom onto this surface. How about here? Will glom onto the type O? No, that's why type O is the universal donor, right? All these antibodies here, right? They have nothing to grab onto, okay? They don't have anything to grab onto, right? Type O is known as the universal donor. Type AB is the universal recipient. So really? You have to get A. Pardon? A or O. Yeah, I have to get A or O. So here's the thing. Now, this is where it gets confusing for folks because they forget this. When we're talking about blood transfusion, all right, it's the recipient's antibodies. That's what you need to know, all right? In order to know that, if I'm type A, then you know that I have to have the anti-B antibodies, okay? So when I get blood from somebody, my antibodies are going to actually interact with whatever the donor's erythrocytes are, okay? So this can then cause that agglutination, which can block blood vessels, mess up normal circulation, and it can cause this process, hemolysis. Lysis is the breakdown. All right, which is damaging the red blood cells, which can cause organ damage because when they, the cells start to lyse, they can, like, uh, asteroids flying through, all right, a space station, if you ever watch the science fiction, just shreds it apart, okay? Like buckshot flying through a piece of wood, okay? It just will shred the organs. So we'll use an example, okay? All right, so here we're seeing two things. All right, we've got our type B recipient. So this person is type B. So what type of antibodies do they have? Anti-A, good, okay? So guess what our donor is? They're type A. So does that, what does that tell me? What's the surface antigen? Yeah, surface antigen is A, okay? So was a stroke caused by blood clot just in the brain or anywhere? Well, eventually, uh, the stroke can be, it doesn't necessarily have to be a clot. It can be an aneurysm too, Brittany, all right? Um, but basically, a stroke is when you have decreased blood flow to specific areas of the brain. So it can be from a clot. It can be from a broken blood vessel. Yep. So now, all right, zoom out here, okay? So now in our blood, okay? All right, I'm the recipient, I'm B, here are my B, all right, erythrocytes, all right? They have the surface antigen B there, okay, which was fine for my own antibodies because these are anti-A. Here's my anti, let me highlight. So recipient, recipient, okay? So I have the type B, but I have the anti-A antibody. And now you've just given me type A blood from the donor, okay, which has the A antigen, okay? So let's go back to our chart. Whoops. So here I am, okay? I'm type B now in this example. So this, all right, I have these type of antibodies floating around, anti-A antibodies. You just gave me type A blood. So my antibodies, see how the circle's there? It's going to glom onto that, and it's going to agglutinate, okay? Think through it. I know it's tough. Again, I tried to explain this. It's, whenever I teach this, and I do the same thing, I want to talk about the bl uh, blood donation and the transfusions, but I have to fight it off.
Mm -hmm. The blood typing game. Can I Google that? Yeah. All right. Blood typing. I think it is. I looked it up and apparently that person somebody Oh, really? Cool. Well, this is what when we talk about, I don't know if this is part of the game, but when we talk about agglutination tests, has anyone ever had to do one? In New York, when I was, uh, I could draw blood and that we always, we would check. And so, um, this is exactly what happens here, right? When we talk, when we're doing the agglutination test, we're going to just take a, a swab there onto a, a piece of glass with the blood and with the two blood types and see if they match or not, or we can if it's safe to donate. It's a real quick and easy way. So the, um, the positive or negative doesn't matter. That's only going to be if you, well, yeah, it matter because again, but it it matters after you've been exposed. See what I'm saying? So yes, it still matters because you will have antibodies. But I just if you needed blood, can you get egg negative? Uh, no, because I I'm 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 a positive because okay. I have I have antibodies to uh, the antigen D, so you can't give me yeah. If you did, I could I would have glutened it. So it's hard for the RH positive. It says that the RH positive has no potential until you're exposed. Yeah, so, right, 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 but I'm just saying here, okay, since I'm positive, all right, and if you give me, all right, somebody's uh, RH, uh, well, they have to be, um, oh, oh, yep, 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 okay, I misspoke, flip it, flip it, okay, in that situation, okay. Well, if someone's positive, for RH, they can still receive negative, right? Right, 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 right. Yep, I flipped that. My bad. So how do you know the RH comes in the plane? Because you're pregnant now, right? No, it doesn't. I know you're saying pregnant, but it's it's when you're exposed. You already have, you have to be exposed, all right? And that's why, again, the easiest way to tell is to do this test, right, the agglutination test, and see if there's a reaction. And that's usually what they do. All right, if you want to make sure if someone's been exposed, if you can't get a consistent history with them. So if we needed a, if we needed blood, we would have to get A positive for blood. A positive or O. Oh. Yeah, because I mean, they're the universal donor there. But they're like, they're saying they're O positive. Mm -hmm. Does that make them universal donor? Oh yeah. So O negative. Is the universal donor? Oh, oh, oh the, the O blood type is considered to be the universal well, negative donor. Too, because like if you're negative or positive, you can receive negative. But if you right. can't receive positive, you can receive positive. Right. Correct. But, like, yeah, but if you're if you haven't been exposed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Point being is on this one here, what we're showing is when we mix the uh, RH now you got me talking about <laughs> when you mix, all right, you have your 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 blood type, and in this case it is going to be blood type A. All right, and you're mixing it or, or checking it with the the antibody A. Right, uh, you will see that the antibody doesn't have the same uh, binding site here. All right, so you won't have any agglutination. But when we're mixing our type A, all right, for the donor and our type B for the recipient is going to be the anti B. All right, you can see how there's an agglutination. You can see how the the, the antibody here just kind of holds it together, and it causes that clumping there. And I've seen people do this right in the field. Someone say something? Yeah, why are the See, yeah, you know what? I've always wondered that. And it's because it's always considered, a, I don't know, now that I think about it, because it was explained to me that the donor's antibodies, when you're, when you're actually taking in that, that, that blood there, that you're not getting that cross agglutination reaction going on. It's, it has to do with your own antibodies, not the donors. I've always wondered that because of thinking why, but it has to do with how the agglutination process works. I couldn't give you more of a detail on that. Have you done it blood recently? Like, no, I haven't done it blood in a while. Uh, you know, they want people to test positive for the donor, right? Oh, that's more for the antibodies per corporate. 
I don't know if they take my blood. Oh, I thought they wanted people that had COVID. I haven't heard. Donate. Right, right. Well, yeah, yeah. and for, to get out the antibodies there. Yeah. I'd have to check it out. All right, you we're going to. They're testing you while, when they're doing your donating, they're testing you and giving you the results. Right. So, Maybe they could confirm if this helped. Because, I mean, I was. Like, I was negative for antibodies when I donated in September. Well, see, I was positive on the test, but again, I don't know if I had the actual COVID. I mean, some of my symptoms didn't match up. It was possible, but if I have the antibodies, then I would definitely, I'm still good, I think, was it three yeah. months? My whole, my whole family got it, but my sister's boyfriend was saying it, and he never got it, my brother never got it. They yeah. had to test it Yeah, my daughter didn't get it. It was her Because yeah. they were like seven of us that had it. <laughs> Look, I know we're talking here, guys. I'm sorry at home. Um, let's pause here. Let's take a break. All right. I know you guys are 